The descent and the darkness, Moses and the Kabbalah, Solomon, Sheba and the Haram, King Arthur and the Crown Chakra. As an Egyptian prince, Moses was initiated into the Egyptian mysteries. This is recorded by the Egyptian historian Mantiu, who identified Heliopolis as a mystery school. It is confirmed in Acts 7.22, where the Apostle Stephen says, And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Indeed, the teachings of Moses are steeped in Egyptian wisdom. For example, Spell 125 in the Book of the Dead describes the judgment of the dead. The spirit is required to declare to Osiris that he has led a good life, then deny having committed a list of specific immoral acts to the 42 judges of the dead. I have not robbed, I have not killed, I have not borne false witness, and so on. Of course, this predates the Ten Commandments. As no degener denigration of Moses to point this out, his teachings could not have been done otherwise than grew out of given historical value. What is historical significantly about Moses is the way he reframed the ancient wisdom of this with the aim of leading humankind into the next stage of the evolution of consciousness. When Moses fled into exile in the desert, he encountered a wise old teacher. Jethro was an African Ethiopian high priest, keeper of a library of stone tablets. When Moses married, his daughter Jethro initiated him to a higher level. This initiation is what made is what being alluded to in the story of the burning bush. When Moses saw the burning bush not being consumed by the fire, this is a vision of the self that is not destroyed by the purging fire that awaits on the other side of the grave. A sense of, of mission arose out of Moses' vision of the burning bush, an impulse to work for the greater good of humanity, to lead all the land flowing with milk and honey. But then Moses hesitated before the magnitude of the task in front of him. God stiffened his resolve, and thou shalt take this rod in thy hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. When Moses journeyed back to Egypt, he was determined to persuade the Pharaoh to set my people free. Moses and his brother Aaron stood in the throne room. Aaron suddenly threw his rod down to the ground to change magically into a snake. The Pharaoh ordered his court magician to match the feet, but as they did, so Aaron's snake swallowed theirs. As the battle of wills between Moses and the Pharaoh unfolded, Moses used his own rod or wand to direct the course of events. They bring fire and hail down from the sky, they bring on a plague of locusts, they part the Red Sea, they strike a rock to cause water to gush out of it. What does this mean? I suspect many readers will be well ahead of me, but the folk legend is that this rod was carved out of the wood from a tree of the Garden of Eden, points to its deeper meaning. The rod is part of the vegetable dimension of the cosmos. By mastering it and manipulating it, it runs through its own body. Moses, now in Hadith, was also able to master and manipulate the cosmos around him. Later, after Moses had given up trying to persuade the Pharaoh to set his people free, and had led them out into the Sinai Desert, he came down from the mountain with the tablets of stone. Moses proved to be a hard taskmaster, and some ways harder than the Pharaohs. Again and again, his people failed to live up to his demands. At one point, when they were punished by a plague of fiery deadly serpents, number 719, to save them, Moses nailed a bronze serpent across a raised horizontal pole. John 3.14 comments on this passage in the Old Testament. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Clearly, John is seeing the bronze serpent as a foreshadowing. The crucified Jesus Christ, lifted up, carries with it a sense of being transformed or transfigured. The bronze serpent has been smelted and so looks forward. John suggests his transfiguration of the material body of humanity. The rod that Moses used to smite the Egyptians and to discipline his own people was an image of the Lucifer serpent of animal consciousness that has been straightened and subdued by the willpower and moral discipline that is very hard to maintain. The great gift Moses gave his people then was guilt. Morality emerges in the history with Moses and with it a call to change of heart. If we look at the Ten Commandments from the perspective of the esoteric doctrine, what, most, what is most significant is the way that the first two commandments ban the use of images in religious practice and called upon the Jews to worship no other gods. Following Abraham, Moses was working toward a new kind of religion that did away with the practices of the older religions with the elaborate ceremony, the loud clashing symbols, the blinding clouds, the smoking, speaking idols. The old religion aimed to diminish consciousness. 
as worshippers would attain access to the square boards but without an uncontrolled way, and the great overwhelming and riotous visions of the followers of Osiris. It was this that Moses was concerned to roll back and replace with a thoughtful, more conscious communion with the divine. By this ban on images, Moses is also helping create the conditions that would make abstract thought possible. The Ten Commandments and other laws of Exodus and Deuteronomy form Moses' public teachings. They are for all the people. In the esoteric tradition, he also taught seventy elders the Kabbalah, the secret mystical teachings of Judaism at the same time. The Kabbalah is as broad a church as a major world religion, and we will return to it in different aspects of it. Again, there is no den denigration of Moses or the Kabbalah to point that out. The that it grew out of older tradition, the number of must mysticism of the Egyptians. Reams of mathematical calculations have not come down to us from ancient Egypt, but their understanding of higher mathematics has it survived in Egyptian art. For example, the Eye of Horus is often represented as the Ujjayi, which we now know is made up of a number of hieroglyphs representing fractions, which add up to a total of 63, 64. If you reverse this and divide 64 by 63, you come up with what has been called the greatest secret of the Egyptians, a number called Comma of Pythagoras. Highly complex numbers like the Comma of Pythagoras, Pi and Phi, sometimes called the Golden Proportion, are known as irrational numbers. They lie deep in the structure of the physical universe and were seen by the Egyptians as the principal control in creation, the principles by which matter is precipitated from the cosmic mind. Today, scientists recognize that the comma of Pythagoras pi and the golden proportion as well as closely related to the Fibonacci sequence or universal constants that describe the complex patterns. In astronomy, music, and physics, for example, the Fibonacci sequence is a series in which each number of the sum of the two preceding it. Spirals are built up according to this sequence. It is rampant in nature in a spiral of galaxies, the shape of ammonites, and their arrangement of leaves on a stem. To the Egyptians, these numbers were also the secret harmonies of the cosmos, and they incorporated them as rhythms and proportions in the construction of their pyramids and temples. A building made this way would be ideal. A hall, a doorway, a window, which is the golden proportion built in there, would be inevitably pleasing to the human spirit. The great temples of Egypt are, of course, bursting with vegetable forms, such as the bulrush shaped pillars of the great hy hypostyle at Karnak, but it was the vegetable life that gave proportion to human limb. The vegetable life that turns ribs and makes them curve according to the pleasing mathematical formula that the temple builders were particularly concerned to reproduce. The point is that Egyptian temples were built this way because the gods were no longer able to inhabit bodies of flesh and blood. A temple was built to be the body of a god, no less. God's spirit lived inside the vegetable and mineral bodies that was in the temple, just as the human spirit lives inside his vegetable and material bodies. The Hebrews have not left a rich architectural heritage like the Egyptians. Their number of mysticism has gone, come down to us encoded in la the language of the books of Moses. The great book of the Kabbalah is the Zohar, which is a vast commentary on the first five books of the Old Testament, traditionally ascribed to Moses. If the world is materialized, Thought, then according to the Kabbalah, words and letters were the means by which the process happened. God created the world by manipulating and making patterns or the Hebrew letters of the alphabet. Hebrew letters, therefore, are magical properties. The patterns they make in Scripture open up layers and deep great vistas of hidden meaning. Exodus chapter 14 contains three verses. 19, 20, and 21, which each consists of 72 letters. If you write these verses on top of one another so that the 72 letters appear in columns, then read the column at a time, you'll discover the secret 72 names of God. Each Hebrew letter is also num a number. Aleph, the Hebrew A, is one. Beth is two, and so on. There are complex connections here. The Hebrew word for father has a numerical value of three, and the word for mother has a value of 41. The Hebrew word for child is 44, the combination of father and mother. It gets more mind blowing. The numerical value of the Hebrew phrase for the Garden of Eden is 144. The numerical value for the tree of knowledge is 233. 
If you divide 233 by 144, you get very close to 4 decimal points of the value of the golden ratio 5. In the last few decades, mathematicians have applied themselves to the task of finding messages encoded in the text of the books of Moses. Breakthrough work by Wotstum, Rips, and Rosenberg discovered transcription codes used equidistant letter sequences. These published results include some names of positive biblical historical figures of Hebrew history. What is yet no propositions, no sequences of sentences or anything like that could be read as a message. Again, it's not my secret to reveal, but one Cambridge-based stat- statistician has shown me the results of applying an extremely complex skip code, a code verified as valid by Cambridge University professors of mathematics. The fragments that show- he showed me were reminiscent of Psalms. Imagine if a whole other book or series of books were encoded in the text we have, wouldn't each of the text have different layers of meaning too? Some complexity is far beyond the capacity of normal human intelligence.